So welcome back everybody to our afternoon session of the first International Women in Neuroscience Parma workshop. We hope that you enjoy your break and your lunch because we are going in a very challenging session um, about the damage self. So if this morning we talk about how the sense of touch uh, together with other modality is a crucial uh, sense able to um, construct and develop our implicit sense of self, this afternoon we are going to see what happens when this implicit sense of self is destroyed, damaged, or altered. And we will do that thanks to Dr. Francesca Ferri, uh, looking at what happened in schizophrenia. We will also see what happened uh, and the role between uh, anorexia nervosa and uh, the affective touch, thanks to Dr. Uh, Laura Crucianelli. And uh, uh, what happened to our body ownership, peripersonal space, and even multisensory integration in the dissociative subtype of PTSD, thanks to Dr. Daniela Rabellino. That's for the psychiatric side. Uh, we will also have a look on the neurological side, thanks to Dr. Francesca uh, Frassinetti and her work in uh, uh, right brain damage patients. And we will um, see what happened to their implicit and explicit processing of self body parts and not only, also uh, self voices that are quite amazing topic. Um, we strongly wanted this session uh, in the workshop because as we all know, have a side to the pathological conditions could be very informative also for um, the healthy or standard functioning of different processes. And that's particularly true when we speak about something that we daily in our daily life we take for granted, like our implicit self, um, sense of self. And this afternoon we have the opportunity to spread our sight on so many different pathologies and so probably to be inspired by their commonalities and the similarities. So let's move to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Francesca Ferri. She's assistant professor at the Department of Neuroscience, Imaging and Clinical Sciences at the University of Chieti Pescara in Italy. She earned her PhD in molecular and cellular biology at the University of Bologna and her second <laughs> PhD in neuroscience at the University of Parma under the supervision of, prof of Professor Vittorio Gallese. Francesca's research focuses on how the brain integrates sensory motor information about the body with sensory processing of the external world and to build, obviously or not, a coherent representation of the bodily self and promote adaptive behavior. And this afternoon she's going to speak about tactile processing and the bodily self in schizophrenia. Thank you, Francesca. The floor is yours. Uh, hi, Martina. Hi, Francesca. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, organizing this uh, amazing event and thanks for uh, uh, inviting me uh, uh, to uh, uh, talk about uh, schizophrenia and the sense of touching uh, schizophrenia. Uh, I'm trying to share my uh, slides. Uh, it seems I'm not succeeding in that. So let's try to share the screen. It works. And then I'm trying to open your presentation. Open my presentation. So, okay, we see your slides. Perfect. Can you see my presentation? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, I will talk about tactile processing and the bodily self in uh, uh, schizophrenia. Uh, Schizophrenia is a, a psychiatric condition uh, uh, that is characterized by a change in the subjective experience of the self. And core self disturbances in a schizophrenia are mostly related to the fundamental self, the minimal self, which is a, a pre-reflective dimension of the self that can be contrasted with the reflective self and uh, the narrative self. Importantly, many authors, several authors, have stated that uh, the minimal self is rooted in bodily experiences, hence a co-component of the minimal self would be the bodily self. The bodily self that is uh, related to uh, the representation of one's body and to a stable sense of owning it and acting through it. Well, this uh, 
pre-reflective dimension of the self is lost in schizophrenia. And uh, uh, schizophrenia patients often report sentences like, uh, I feel like a robot, or there is a split between my mind and my body, and so on. Uh, abnormal bodily experiences in uh, schizophrenia uh, uh, have not uh, have been uh, so far reported, not only in patients, but uh, along the whole schizophrenia continuum, including uh, individuals with a high clinical uh, uh, risk and with high schizotypal personality traits. And from uh, um, a clinical perspective, uh, these abnormal bodily experiences uh, are reflected in clinical symptoms like uh, disturbed synesthesia, kinesthetic hallucinations, disruptions of body structure and boundaries. And importantly, uh, these body perception disturbances are regarded uh, among the basic symptoms of schizophrenia. Uh, uh, which have been uh, uh, described years ago as the, uh, by Huber as the earliest subjectively experienced symptoms of the illness. Uh, basic symptoms uh, can uh, be uh, assessed using the schizophrenia proneness uh, uh, instrument. That's from a clinical perspective. From an empirical perspective, abnormal bodily experiences have been shown along the schizophrenia continuum uh, in uh, several studies. And these uh, uh, abnormal bodily experiences have been shown at different uh, levels, at the level of primary somatosensory functions as a reduced tactile sensitivity, impaired proprioception, uh, transient change in the shape, size, or location of body parts, but also uh, at uh, the level of higher order somatosensory functions like uh, altered uh, sense of body ownership, altered uh, bodily self boundary. Uh, so, uh, based on these uh, premises, uh, our research uh, focuses on uh, the investigation of whether uh, these uh, primary and higher order somatosensory dysfunctions are uh, uh, somehow related in uh, schizophrenia and high schizotypy, and whether they share common neural mechanisms. Uh, let's start from uh, 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 abnormalities of bodily self-boundaries uh, in schizophrenia. Schizophrenia patients uh, uh, report uh, alteration of the lived space. Uh, they report sentences like, uh, I felt spaceless, or person sitting six, six feet away seem to be at an infinite distance. Uh, sentence like this uh, suggests that in these patients, uh, uh, peripersonal space boundary are uh, uh, abnormal. Uh, at this point, we all know what peripersonal space is. Uh, peripersonal space is uh, the space immediately surrounding the body, which can be contrasted uh, with the extrapersonal space. Uh, the peripersonal, we can reach the peripersonal space by hand. We cannot reach the, uh, peripersonal, the extrapersonal space by hand. And this uh, categorization between peri and extrapersonal space uh, is also supported by uh, neurons uh, recorded in premotor and parietal cortices of monkeys and humans. And the activity of these neurons is stronger in response to uh, uh, near stimuli, stimuli as compared to far stimuli, especially if the stimuli approaches uh, uh, dynamically uh, uh, our body. Uh, the activity of these neurons uh, make us uh, also faster in uh, detecting and responding stimuli occurring near the body. So, uh, in a recent study, we measured the uh, location of the boundary of peripersonal space in uh, uh, schizophrenia patients and individual, individuals with high and low uh, 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 schizotypy. Uh, and to do this, we used uh, um, uh, a behavioral task, an audio tactile peripersonal space task, uh, that uh, Andrea Serino and uh, uh, his group proposed a few years ago. In this task, participants are presented with looming sounds or flat sounds in control conditions, and at different delays from the onset of the sound, uh, they receive a tactile stimulus on their hand, and they are asked to just uh, press a button as soon as they uh, perceive, they detect uh, the uh, tactile stimulus on the hand. Uh, the tactile stimulus is delivered at different onset and delays, which corresponds to uh, different, di different subjectively uh, perceived distance of the uh, sound. And if we plot the tactile reaction time as a function of these uh, uh, distances, uh, we obtain a distribution uh, of reaction time that uh, can be fit uh, using a sigmoid function. 
And uh, uh, the central point of the uh, sigmoid uh, uh, curve uh, can be taken as an index of the location of the peripersonal space uh, boundary at the individual level. And also uh, uh, the slope of the curve uh, uh, can be used as an index, uh, an estimation of the shape of uh, uh, the peripersonal space boundary uh, with uh, a steeper slope uh, uh, indicating faster transition from far to uh, near space. Uh, using this uh, uh, task, uh, uh, we found that in schizophrenia, uh, the location of uh, uh, peripersonal space boundary is closer to the body uh, uh, as compared to uh, uh, healthy controls. And in fact, we found significantly a different central point between the two groups. Also, the slope uh, was uh, significantly, uh, significantly different between the two groups. And in fact, the slope was steeper in schizophrenia patients than in healthy controls, indicating a faster transition from far to near space. Uh, similar results were found also uh, uh, in uh, high schizotypy individuals uh, as compared to low schizotypy individuals. Uh, also, high schizotypy individuals showed a uh, narrower peripersonal space boundary as compared to uh, a low schizotypy individuals. In this case, the shape of the peripersonal space boundary was not different between the two groups. But why do patients with schizophrenia and individuals with schizotypal personality with high level of schizotypal personality traits present a narrow peripersonal space? And why peripersonal space boundaries are sharply defined in patients uh, with schizophrenia? Well, uh, to answer this question, we hypothesized possible contribution from uh, uh, three neural impairments that have been uh, consistently uh, uh, reported in uh, the schizophrenia spectrum, excitation inhibition imbalance, failures in top-down signaling, and synaptic density uh, decrease. And to test this hypothesis, we uh, adopted a computational approach in collaboration with Peggy Serie and Renato Paredes from the University of uh, Edinburgh. Uh, we started from uh, a model that Andrea Serin and this group uh, proposed uh, to model the reaction time collected from uh, uh, healthy participants uh, during the uh, audio tactile peripersonal space task that I just presented. Uh, briefly, uh, the model describes a uh, tactile area with tactile neurons uh, encoding a portion of the skin that corresponds to the left hand of an individual. Uh, there is an auditory area with auditory uh, neurons encoding the uh, sp space surrounding uh, the left hand. And then there is a multisensory area with a multisensory neurons, um, uh, which is uh, connected to all the tactile and auditory uh, neurons via feedback and feed forward uh, connections. Uh, connections that are stronger um, with neurons uh, uh, coding, encoding the peripersonal space and weaker with neurons encoding the uh, extrapersonal space. Okay, this model works very well with healthy participants, but it needed to be adapted uh, to brain function of uh, schizophrenia patients. And uh, uh, to do this, we uh, uh, introduced uh, uh, neural impairments uh, like excitation inhibition imbalance, and to uh, do this, we uh, change the value of a, a parameter that indicates the strength of excitatory connectivity between uh, uh, unisensory tactile neurons and between unisensory auditory neurons. To introduce uh, failures in top-down signaling, uh, we uh, changed, we varied uh, the uh, value of a parameter that indicates the weight of the feedback synapses from multisensory to unisensory neurons. And uh, to introduce a synaptic density uh, decrease, we uh, uh, increase the percentage of uh, pruned feed forward connections. And then we tested uh, the different models to look for the model that uh, best fit to uh, reaction time that we collected from uh, a schizophrenia patient and high uh, schizotypy uh, participants. Here are the results. Uh, the uh, uh, solid lines and the dashed lines uh, represents the uh, sigmoid fit to 
the data generated uh, uh, by the, the model. And uh, uh, the dots uh, represent the real data, uh, the black dots, data collected from schizophrenia patients, gray dots, data collected from high schizotypy uh, participants. And as you can see, the model that does uh, fit to uh, schizophrenia patients reaction time is the model in which we um, introduced uh, excited, uh, both excitation inhibition imbalance and uh, uh, decreased synaptic density. While the model that does fit the uh, reaction time collected from high schizotypy participants is the one who, uh, where we only introduced uh, um, excitation inhibition imbalance. And uh, the table on the bottom shows the uh, uh, values of the parameter generated by the fitting procedure. Uh, so this uh, uh, data show that at least two neural mechanisms account for peripersonal space abnormalities in uh, schizophrenia and high schizotypy. Uh, on one hand, we have increased excitation of unisensory tactile neurons, uh, uh, causing the narrower peripersonal space empirically observed in both uh, individuals with high schizotypy and schizophrenia patients. On the other hand, we have a uh, decrease in the synaptic density uh, between unisensory and multisensory neurons, which is likely a consequence of the excitation inhibition imbalance, and which causes uh, a sharper peripersonal space uh, empirically observed in schizophrenia. Uh, this is uh, uh, our proposal. Um, in addition to this, we uh, uh, wanted to further investigate the effect of excitation uh, inhibition imbalance uh, in tactile areas uh, using the very same model to simulate uh, another function, another somatosensory function uh, uh, at a lower level. Uh, so we use the model to simulate the uh, administration of uh, uh, two uh, tactile stimuli on the left hand, two tactile stimuli separated by uh, two centimeters. Uh, in the figure of the top, the gray scale uh, represented the firing rate of the neurons that encode a given coordinate of the tactile area. And as you can see in schizophrenia, there is a, a larger spread of the activity of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the stimulated uh, neurons uh, as compared to uh, what you observe in healthy controls. And uh, uh, this um, spread of the activity leads to uh, uh, an overlapping of the representation of the two stimuli uh, in the cortical space, as shown on the bottom. Uh, which uh, consequently uh, causes a higher discrimination threshold. So, uh, based on this uh, uh, simulated, uh, based on this simulation, uh, we can uh, um, suggest that uh, reduced tactile discrimination that has, be, that has been uh, um, consistently reported for the schizophrenia continuum uh, could be accounted for by increased recurrent excitation in uh, uh, tactile neurons. So uh, this uh, uh, excitation inhibition imbalance in uh, uh, tactile areas seem to contribute to both primary and higher order somatosensory functions. Okay, so uh, uh, as for the, the first question, uh, it seems that uh, yes, uh, um, primary and higher order somatosensory functions share common uh, uh, dysfunctions, neural dysfunctions. Um, but the, uh, the point now is, uh, 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 is there a direct interaction between uh, 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 impaired uh, uh, primary and higher order somatosensory functions? And more specifically, uh, is there an association between impaired tactile sensitivity and uh, uh, higher order bodily self uh, disturbances? Well, to answer this question, uh, we asked uh, uh, the, a group of uh, schizophrenia patients to perform two tasks a finger localization task assessing uh, primary somatosensory function and uh, uh, the rubber hand illusion task, uh, which uh, uh, is useful to assess uh, a higher order somatosensory functions such as the sense of body ownership. In the finger localization task, uh, schizophrenia patients uh, and healthy controls were asked to localize, to identify 
uh, the uh, uh, touched uh, finger that could see. In a second condition, they were asked to identify the uh, unseen uh, touched uh, um, uh, finger. And in a, third in a third condition, they were asked to identify uh, a pair of uh, um, uh, stimulated uh, uh, fingers. Uh, also in this case, the stimulated fingers were hidden from the uh, participants' view. Um, of course, the, uh, uh, the digit that was stimulated or the pair of digits that were stimulated uh, changed, uh, was changed across uh, trials. Uh, okay, uh, we, uh, find, we found that uh, schizophrenia patients uh, were um, less accurate than uh, healthy controls only in the, uh, her, the third uh, most complex uh, condition. And this is good because uh, it suggests that it tells us that the lower ac accuracy uh, was not just due to um, impaired tactile sensitivity, uh, which would affect all the three uh, conditions. And we also find that this uh, uh, lower uh, accuracy was uh, associated to uh, higher um, uh, scores at the uh, basic symptoms scale, the schizophrenia proneness instrument. Uh, then the same participants were asked to uh, um, the same schizophrenic patients uh, were asked to uh, um, uh, were submitted to a rubber hand illusion task. Uh, again, we have uh, three experimental condition, a main um, uh, condition in which the participants' hand and the rubber hand were synchronously uh, stimulated. A first control condition in which the uh, uh, the um, patient's hand and the uh, rubber hand were asynchronously uh, simulated, and a third condition in which uh, the the patient's hand uh, and the rubber hand were asynchronously uh, were again synchronously stimulated, but. Uh, the rubber hand was in a, a incongruent position uh, uh, with respect to the participant's uh, hand. Uh, we measure the illusion, the rubber hand illusion in patients using the uh, proprioceptive uh, drift, an implicit measure uh, uh, that reflects uh, the uh, subjective, uh, uh, sub subjectively uh, perceived shift of the uh, patient's hand uh, towards the uh, rubber hand. And we found that uh, the uh, uh, rubber hand illusion uh, was significantly perceived uh, by uh, schizophrenia patients uh, in the main condition, but not in the two uh, controlled uh, conditions. And finally, uh, we tested the association between uh, rubber hand illusion uh, index and accuracy at the finger localization task. And we found that uh, patients with lower accuracy at the finger localization task uh, showed also a higher proneness uh, to uh, the rubber hand illusion. Uh, to sum up, primary somatosensory impairments uh, seem to be linked to uh, basic symptoms uh, and also to uh, a higher order uh, somatosensory dysfunction like proneness to a body illusion, the rubber hand illusion. And these results support the idea that primary somatosensory impairments may represent risk markers and contribute to more complex bodily self disturbances uh, such as malleable body uh, image and reduced sense of body ownership. Okay. But if uh, it's true that somatosensory impairments uh, uh, can represent uh, risk markers, uh, they should be present also in individuals with high schizotypy, uh, in which uh, uh, in a study we also showed signs of excitation inhibition imbalance. So the question is, uh, are these uh, mm, uh, primary somatosensory dysfunction present also in uh, uh, schizotypy, high schizotypy? Uh, so we asked uh, uh, participants with uh, high schizotypy levels and low schizotypy levels to, pro to um, uh, <clears throat> uh, perform the uh, finger localization task. And also in this case, we found a lower accuracy in individuals with high uh, schizotypy levels as compared to participants with low schizotypy uh, levels. And uh, their performance was also more viable, as shown in the confusion matrix uh, uh, on the bottom. Uh, 
uh, where um, it is uh, uh, shown that uh, uh, the kind of error uh, uh, committed by uh, high schizotype individuals uh, was uh, more variable as compared to uh, low schizotype uh, individuals. So uh, to sum up, uh, uh, we uh, found that uh, uh, the excitation inhibition imbalance is uh, a neural dysfunction uh, behind uh, uh, tactile discrimination uh, impairments in uh, uh, schizophrenia and uh, high uh, schizotypy, uh, which in turn uh, seems to uh, predict uh, to be associated to a higher order somatosensory dysfunction like the sense of body ownership. And this excitation inhibition imbalance uh, seems to be also behind uh, um, the uh, disturbances in uh, uh, the sense of body, body ownership, in, uh, sorry, um, the uh, bodily self boundary, uh, as we've shown in the peripersonal space uh, uh, task. Uh, uh, if the tactile discrimination uh, dysfunction uh, may be at also uh, the impact of excitation inhibition imbalance on uh, peripersonal space impairments is uh, something that still uh, needs to be tested. In conclusion, uh, uh, we propose that uh, abnormalities in uh, various dimensions of corporeality and bodily self are common features in the schizophrenia continuum since their very early stages. And we think that its logical features of schizophrenia spectrum disorders may be better understood by further explicating their shared bodily roots. Uh, we suggest that agents with an impaired understanding of the structure of their bodies may be more malleable to adopting faulty models of their body's spatial mapping and location. And finally, uh, the lack of a coherent understanding of oneself as a structural entity in the world uh, uh, according to us, can be uh, associated with uh, deficits in the minimal self. I want to thank all the uh, uh, colleagues and the co-authors of the studies I presented from the University of Chiedi Pescara, the University of Essex, the University of Edinburgh, the University of Padua, and last but not least, uh, Professor Vittorio Pallese uh, from the University of Parma, with whom this journey into the uh, bodily self in schizophrenia started uh, <laughs> a few years ago, when I was a PhD student in his lab. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, Francesca. Very, very interesting uh, talk. So, uh, so now we have time for questions. So the first question is uh, from uh, Andrea. Uh, very interesting, Francesca. There are data about uh, impaired EI imbalance in mice models of autism. Uh, not sure about schizophrenia. Uh, there uh, any evidence of some deficit in unimodal tactile processing in animal models of schizophrenia? Yes, Andrea, uh, the question is from Andrea Serino. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, to Andrea. <laughs> uh, no, as far as I know, uh, uh, but I don't know much about this uh, uh, literature, uh, I'm not aware of any study showing uh, um, uh, primary somatosensory dysfunction in uh, uh, animal models of schizophrenia. But that's a very interesting question, and uh, I didn't think uh, about that honestly, and I will certainly look into, uh, into that. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I have just a curiosity. So um, I was thinking about uh, the computational model. So maybe do you think that uh, future studies or future computational model could take into account uh, uh, the motor information? Uh, I'm thinking about the plasticity of peripersonal space. Uh, so I'm not an expert in computational models, so I don't know how to do this kind of, uh, to add this kind of information, but I was thinking about that, so maybe adding this information could reveal some uh, uh, important uh, aspect and information of the, the mechanism underlying the plasticity of peripersonal space. Yes, that's that's a, a, a great suggestion. Thank you. 
Um, I'm not an expert in computational model either. <laughs> this <also laughs> has been done in collaboration with uh, yeah, Peggy and uh, Renato from the University of uh, Edinburgh. But yes, uh, it's possible to uh, introduce uh, this uh, factor of plasticity in uh, the model. Uh, I think they they uh, they should they, they are able to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, I know you have data, so it's something that we can do. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, of course, <laughs> in collaboration. <laughs> it was a boomerang question. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you so much. Um, so I think that we can stop because there are no more questions. So thank you so much, Francesca, for your amazing presentation. So thank you. Thank Thanks. you.